What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. You can find all of my running back analysis and rankings at NoahMoreParties.com. And today's video, I went through the, the the keep trade cut dynasty running back rankings. I took all the rookies out because I don't want to talk about them. And I looked at just the veteran current NFL players on keep trade cut. And I compared it with my own dynasty running back rankings with rookies removed over at nomoreparties.com. And I went through with a fine toothed comb to find the players that had the biggest disparity in where they were ranked by the public and where they were ranked by myself. And today's video is three players, not necessarily the three who were, who had the greatest disparity. Uh, I've got some guys down in like the RB65 range who keep trade cut has like in the RB90 range. So that, that's a big difference, but we're, th we're all just throwing darts there anyway. But these are three guys who I feel relatively strongly about in a positive direction compared to where the Dynasty community seems to have them. Let's get into it. The first guy I want to talk about is the first guy in my dynasty rankings, and that is Christian McCaffrey, who is the RB4 over on Keep Trade Cut behind Brees Hall, behind Jonathan Taylor, and behind Kenneth Walker. There are seven-ish guys in, you know, a tier, a, a tier or two at the top of the dynasty running back rankings, and they are uh, Brees Hall, Jonathan Taylor, Kenneth Walker, Christian McCaffrey, Travis Etienne, Saquon, and Josh Jacobs. After that, we get into Eckler, Pollard, Ramondre type territory. But I think these guys are the the guys who are viewed as having, you know, one or the other, or maybe even both of, you know, really talented youth or high level, like recent slash immediate production. Brees Hall obviously is young, Kenneth Walker, ETN, all young guys. And then we've got Barkley, Jacobs, CMC, and Jonathan Taylor, who people view as like in their prime, ready to produce right now. Of those top seven guys, their PPR points per game from last season, Brees Hall, who is the RB1 on Keep Trade Cut, averaged 16.4 points per game. Pretty, pretty damn good for a rookie on a not very good team. Jonathan Taylor last year averaged 13.3 PPR points per game. The year prior, he averaged 21.9. So pretty nice ceiling from Jonathan Taylor that he just was not able to hit last year. Kenneth Walker last year, 13.5 points per game. After week six, his first game with like a significant amount of carries, like 20 carries or something from week six on. He had 16.6 points per game, so very solid there. Uh, Christian McCaffrey averaged 21 points per game last year, 21.2 with San Francisco. Travis Etienne last year, 12.1 points per game. Nowhere near uh, the rest of these guys, frankly. Uh, Saquon Barkley, 17.8 points per game last year. He has not averaged at least 20 points per game since his rookie season in 2018. And Josh Jacobs last year, 19.3 points per game in a massive career season his only season of his career above 15.4 points per game. This is seven good football players. It's fairly obvious to me, uh, Christian McCaffrey has scored well over 20 points per game multiple times in his career. He did it yet again in two different situations on two different teams, one of them bad, one of them good, last season uh, as a 26-year-old. It's clear to me that even at 26, nobody in the league has the fantasy ceiling that Christian McCaffrey has. You could argue Jonathan Taylor from a couple years ago, but Christian McCaffrey was scoring a lot more points than that you know, a couple years ago in his career, and I think his ceiling is higher than the 21.2 points per game he scored with San Francisco last season. Austin Eckler also might be an exception, but I think, he, yes, he has the ceiling, but he's not part of this conversation because his his production is so fundamentally tied to the role he has in the current Chargers offense. And as they continue year after year to try to add, you know, kind of a, an RB2 there to be with him, we don't have guarantees that that role is going to continue, especially now that he's requesting a trade. We don't know if he'll get that. I just think Austin Eckler is clearly not part of this group, even though he does score a lot of fantasy points. So basically, I think Christian McCaffrey, he's one of the few older backs in the league who is not at all at risk of being replaced. Like Mixon might get cut. Derrick Henry is g getting older again. Kamara 
is maybe suspended and, you know, they're, they just added Jamal Williams. That's not a replacement, but that's a significant addition to the back. Like, there are all these, these older aging running backs in the league. Christian McCaffrey seems like one of the few of them who has, seems like it would be a big, big shock for the 49ers to add somebody in the draft that was at the level of someone who could challenge Christian McCaffrey for the starting job. Like, I don't even know who in this running back, like if they added Gibbs or Bijan, like outside of those two guys, I don't even know who they would add in this class that would be a a legitimate challenger to Christian McCaffrey's job. So unless you think he gets hurt, which he stayed healthy all of last season after people thought he would just always get hurt, unless you think he gets hurt and unless you think he falls off, the only scenario in which I think Christian McCaffrey should not be the RB1 in Dynasty is if you're not trying to win in year one. I think I've kind of pivoted my approach to a hypothetical startup draft this offseason, uh, maybe given the older landscape and how kind of devalued these older running backs have become this offseason to where I now want to win now in startups versus uh, like a productive struggle, kick the can down the road. Uh, type of situation, which is still fun, but I think this year is a good year to go win now, specifically given the running back landscape. So unless you're not trying to win in year one, or you think McCaffrey gets hurt, the only reason to not have him at RB1 is you think he falls off, which I I don't think is crazy. His box-adjusted efficiency rating and his relative success rate from last season, which are two uh, metrics that I developed that look at a player's per carry efficiency and per carry like consistency given the given the box counts that he's seeing on his carries relative to what his teammates produced his box adjusted efficiency rating and relative success rate last year were both below like the average benchmarks for kind of how the how the metrics are designed 97.7% uh, box adjusted efficiency rating last year under 100% means that he's producing less efficiently than the other guys on his team and these numbers are from specifically his time in San Francisco so it's the most relevant information. He was less efficient than the other backs at San Francisco and produced positive outcomes on his carries 2.4% less often than the other backs in San Francisco did. So he was slightly less efficient than the other guys there. Jeff Wilson, Elijah Mitchell, and that was after a 135% box adjusted efficiency rating with Carolina in 2021 and five straight years of a positive relative success rate indicating that he's more consistent on a down-to-down basis at producing positive outcomes than the other guys on his team's Last year was really the first year uh, that he was, well, it was the first year since his his, uh, rookie year, I think, where he had a negative uh, relative success rate and he took a big step back in box adjusted efficiency rating. Is that, did he fall off? Is that a statistical quirk from a, you know, a, a relatively small sample size? Is that just adjusting to a new team and a new scheme, new responsibility? Like, you know, that could be different things. I haven't seen anyone claim this and I don't believe it myself. Like he, he didn't look any worse on the field to me last year. Like he still looked like the old explosive Christian McCaffrey. I don't think, I don't think Kyle Shanahan cares if Christian McCaffrey is a little bit less efficient as a ball carrier than Jeff Wilson and Elijah. Mitchell and Jordan Mason and whoever these guys are that they're like sprinkling in behind him. I don't, I don't think he necessarily cares about that. I think it's important that Christian McCaffrey be like a capable runner, which I think he clearly is. He wasn't way less efficient and way less consistent than the other guys. It was just a little bit. So he's got to be a capable runner. And I think he is, but really his utility for San Francisco and for fantasy comes from his versatility. Like he's, when he's on the field, defenses don't know if he's going to line up in the slot or line up out wide. If Debo Samuel's going to be in the backfield, McCaffrey lining up at wide receiver. They don't know if McCaffrey's going to line up as a tailback with Debo at full. Like they don't know what to do with their personnel to match. And as long as McCaffrey gives them that kind of versatility and that sort of like tough to deal with dynamic on offense, I don't see why they would take him off the field. So that's not going away. He's going to be on the field. I, I didn't notice him getting much worse last year as a player. So unless you're not playing for next year, I think Christian McCaffrey's got to be the RB1 in Dynasty personally. The next guy I want to talk about though is Damian Pierce, who is my RB11 and is the RB15 on Keep Trade Cut. That's not a massive difference. But Keep Trade Cut has these guys over him that I do not have over Damian Pierce. That's Javante Williams, Nick Chubb, Najee Harris, and J.K. Dobbins. I want to go through each of those guys individually. Okay, Javante Williams is the first one. He was solid as a rookie. He matched efficiency on the ground with Melvin Gordon, was an effective player, you know, low-end RB2 type in fantasy, solid rookie season, uh, jumped up to like RB2 in Dynasty at one point. Like everybody was just fully on the Javante Williams train after seeing him basically duplicate the effectiveness of Melvin Gordon as a rookie. I was not on board with that at the time. The receipts are there. 
Uh, he averaged 11 points per game last season before getting hurt, and his his reception totals from week one of the season against this, I think that was against the Seahawks, I believe, uh, account for 25% of all of his fantasy points from last year. He caught, he had like 11 dump off, check down passes from Russell Wilson in game one that accounted for a quarter of his fantasy points scored in the season. The point is not that Javante Williams is bad. I don't think Javante Williams is bad. The point is that even last season before he was hurt in this, you know, this guy that was supposed to be like the RB2 in Dynasty, he wasn't even productive last year because the team was much worse than we thought. It's not like Javante's good enough to just put them on his back and do everything himself. Like, he's not Jim Brown. So things didn't work out last year like the way a lot of people thought they would. And he tore up his knee. He tore what? His ACL, his MCL, and his PCL, I think, in the same knee in in week four, whatever it was, which sucks. Like, we don't want to see you know, exciting young players get hurt, but it seems like there's a wide range of possibilities with this injury. Matthew Barry, after the combine said on his show or whatever that, you know, he, he's got these connections in the NFL and is talking to people at the combine. Um, he says, quote, I'm told there is a very wide range of possibilities regarding Javante Williams's return. There's a chance he's healthy to start the year. There's a chance he misses multiple games, and there's actually a chance he misses all of next year. We don't know what's going to happen with Javante Williams, but drafting him as the RB10 in Dynasty right now after he, you know, has was solid his first couple seasons. But, you know, we don't have any evidence really that he's some sort of elite talent. Uh, Like he hasn't really earned the benefit of the doubt that he's being given by the Dynasty community, in my opinion. And now he's hurt, might be severely hurt, might be hurt for a long time. And he's got Sean Payton as his his coach, which is a good thing because Sean Payton's a good coach, but he's a committee backfield guy who is bringing in free agent running backs who are actively in the media saying that they came to Denver because of the committee backfield coach who now runs things there. So if we want Javante Williams to be like some bell cow running back uh, getting all the touches, he hasn't done that so far in his NFL career. He's been hurt now, and he's now being coached by a coach who is good and has had a lot of productive backfields, but not the kind of backfields where it's like one dude getting all the carries. So I don't really see the argument for Javante Williams over Damian Pearson Dynasty. Nick Chubb, I wouldn't argue either way. If you wanted to take Nick Chubb over over Damian Pierce, I don't think I would have an issue with it. I might do it myself, depending on my mood. Chubb and Pierce are fairly close in my mind. Najee Harris, what is Najee Harris? Just think about what Najee Harris is. He's a big tackle breaker with three down ability. He can catch pass as well. And he doesn't have much top speed. Like that's the archetype of player that he is. That's exactly the archetype of player that Damian Pierce is. And I think given the struggles that Najee Harris had, you know, especially early on last season, um, whether it was a durability issue, you know, not being as effective through through injury, which isn't isn't his fault. Anybody would not be as effective through injury. But whether it was like dealing with injuries slash coming back from like a massive workload the year before that like it, it, things just weren't set up for him to be as effective, whether he just took a step back, it, like whatever it was, he was not as effective last year as he was the year prior. And even then, uh, I think it was largely this, you know, situational factors that caused him to be inefficient as a rookie, but he hasn't been efficient so far in the NFL. We've seen him struggle. We saw him cede some touches to Jalen Warren last year. Najee Harris's big thing is that he's supposed to be this this three-down bell cow who's like a volume play in fantasy football. Damian Pierce already had the edge on him in opportunity share last season. Najee Harris had 70% of the touches, 70% of the opportunities, targets plus carries, where Damian Pierce had 74% of them in the Houston backfield. And I would argue that, yeah, Jalen Warren's a nice little player. I'd argue that the talent level that those backs were competing with in those respective situations are fairly comparable. Um, it's not like Damian Pierce was competing with a bunch of scrubs while Najee Harris was competing with a bunch of studs. Fairly equivalent levels of talent behind them in their backfields. And Pierce was getting more of the work in Houston than Najee was in Pittsburgh. They were back-to-back in PPR points per game. Najee averaged 13.2. Damian Pierce was right behind him at 12.8. And I think Houston is much more likely, really, to make significant improvements on offense this season than Pittsburgh is. Kenny Pickett could take a couple steps forward, but A, he was an older prospect at quarterback who broke out late. We we know that. Uh, I'm not some sort of, I don't have strong Kenny Pickett opinions, you know, one way or the other. But like all things being equal, we'd probably expect greater steps forward early on in his career from like a young quarterback prospect than an older quarterback prospect. So Kenny Pickett is already further along in his development than you would 
think of most rookies who came into the league at a more normal age. And you talk to any Steelers fan who, who watches the team and Matt Canada is being blamed for a lot of the offensive struggles last year uh, at offensive coordinator. He's back. So why would this offense suddenly get better where Houston is in a position to choose a franchise quarterback uh, who is probably going to be better than Davis Mills? So Houston is more likely to improve than Pittsburgh is. I think Damian Pierce and Najee Harris are relatively equivalent talents. I view Damian Pierce as on an upward trajectory, Najee Harris perhaps neutral. J.K. Dobbins has never averaged more than 11.2 points per game in his NFL career. Damian Pierce did 1.5 points per game greater than that last season. J.K. Dobbins has never had greater than a 57.5% opportunity share. And I don't see any reason why the Ravens would view J.K. Dobbins as some sort of potential workhorse. He's relatively undersized. He's not tiny, but he's below average size for an NFL running back. He has gotten hurt recently, and I would imagine they want to you know, protect him going forward rather than suddenly thrusting him into, you know, 20 touches per game. And he's split time with Gus Edwards and some other, you know, guys sprinkled in so far in his NFL career. And John Harbaugh this offseason has spoken about how he views the the running back duo of J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards as, as being set up for, for big things this following season. He's not, he doesn't just talk about J.K. Dobbins. He talks about them as a pair. So I, I don't I don't see any indication that J.K. Dobbins should have a, a significantly different role than he's had so far in his NFL career. And then there's this whole element of like, what if Lamar Jackson leaves? I don't personally believe Mar- or Lamar Jackson leaves, but the options here are the offense stays relatively the same because Lamar returns and they just kind of run it back. And Lamar leaves and the offense gets way worse. And the effect that Lamar has on freezing linebackers and opening up lanes at the line of scrimmage disappears. And J.K. Dobbins' efficiency, which has been his main calling card so far in the NFL, goes way down without Lamar Jackson. So in my opinion, out of these guys, Javante, Chubb, Najee Harris, J.K. Dobbins, Pierce, in my opinion, Pierce has the best combination of floor and ceiling in this tier. Uh, He's a three-down workhorse who can do everything you want on the field, and that gives him a solid floor. He was an RB2 level producer on a bad team last year, and now his team might be getting even better with probably a significant quarterback upgrade. So I like Damian Pierce more than Consensus does. And the last guy I want to talk about here is Aaron Jones, who I have at RB16, Keep Trade Cut has at RB25. I don't think this is this is out of the ordinary, but I think I think of Jones as being part of this sort of tier, not necessarily a tier, but more of like a category of older running backs. We've got like Derrick Henry, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, Joe Mixon, James Conner you could throw in there. And and like I said before, I think, you know, Nick Chubb could go there. I feel like his job feels more secure than those than those other guys. Uh, he's still playing really well. There, there just are a lot fewer questions surrounding Nick Chubb that he doesn't feel like he's a part of this group. Um, but like I said before, I think I lean towards a win-now approach, especially in Dynasty startups right now. And so that necessarily means that I'm going to be higher on older players than consensus rankings that also reflect the sensibilities of people who are going with the productive struggle strategy. My rankings, if I'm win, if I'm going for a win now strategy, are just going to be higher than consensus rankings, given that consensus rankings are made up of people who are win now, productive struggle, somewhere in between. Like, older players are going to just score higher on my rankings anyway. But I also think that Aaron Jones should be much closer to, like, Derrick Henry and Dalvin Cook in this group of running backs than he should be to... Uh, Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, especially someone like James Conner. Keep Trade Cut has Aaron Jones ahead of Mixon and Kamara as well, but just barely. They're much, they're all much further down the rankings than I uh, have Jones. But unlike Mixon, Jones's team is like definitely fully committed to him, at least in the immediate future. M- M- Joe Mixon might get cut. Uh, we don't, we don't know if that's going to happen yet, but it's a possibility. Bengals Twitter wants them to draft Bijan Robinson. So Mixon might not even be around in Cincinnati next year, and then who knows what happens to his value depending on where he goes after that. Aaron Jones is making $11 million next year for the Packers. We know for sure they negotiated in February. So Jones avoided this older running back maybe gets cut thing already. Mixon's dealing with it right now. So less uncertainty for Jones in that department. And unlike Alvin Kamara, 
unless something happens from now until September, Aaron Jones is definitely available for the first weeks of the season where Alvin Kamara might not be depending what happens with his legal situation and any like disciplinary action that the NFL takes in response. So I think he's he's safer than both Kamara and Mixon. He doesn't quite have Derrick Henry's ceiling, but I think he's significantly less likely to fall off. I, I mean, Derrick Henry has seen one of the most extreme workloads we've seen from a running back, especially in recent history. Already broke a foot a year and a half ago now, came back and had another really heavy workload, played well last year, better than I thought he would, stayed healthy when I thought he might not. But we're now just a year later of him taking a beating on an old big body. I think Aaron Jones is less likely to fall off than Derrick Henry is this year, even though he doesn't have Derrick Henry's ceiling. He already was scoring more points per game than Dalvin Cook was last season, despite only scoring two rushing touchdowns. People think of Aaron Jones as this like touchdown monster, and that's where he's gotten a lot of his fantasy production. Last year, he was the RB12 in fantasy while scoring two rushing touchdowns. Like, he, he's not a touchdown-reliant player. And we think of him, you know, like, maybe ceding some touches to A.J. Dillon. That didn't happen last year. A.J. Dillon's opportunity share went down from the season before. He was at 45% in 2021, dipped to 43.5% in 2022. And Dillon took a big step back in the efficiency metrics that I like to look at, while Jones bounced back uh, to look really good after, like, a mini down year in 2021. Keep Tread Cut currently has Aaron Jones, I think, at RB25 and AJ Dillon at RB26. They have them back to back. Given what I just talked about, you know, with Dillon's opportunity, with his efficiency, he's also a 25 year old fourth year running back who has never averaged even 11 points per game in an NFL season. We're treating this guy like he's a superstar in waiting, about to take Aaron Jones's job. It hasn't happened yet through three years. Why would it happen now? And even if you view him as like the younger of the options, he's about to be 25 years old. The AJ Apex for running backs is 25 or 26. AJ Dillon's about to be over the hill himself. Jones is 28, but he's a durable. He's had more starts at running back than anybody in the entire league, except for Zeke Elliott, since he entered the league in 2017. And he hasn't averaged fewer than 14 points per game since 2017. I have no idea why these, why these two guys are back to back on the keep trade cut rankings. I have no idea why Aaron Jones is so far down uh, close to Mixon and Kamara rather than up near Derrick Henry and Dalvin Cook, if not above them. But I am much higher on him, on Damian Pierce, and on Christian McCaffrey than consensus. Yeah, there it is. Three guys I'm higher on than consensus. Maybe next time I will do three guys that I'm lower on than consensus. Put my hater hat on. But uh, thanks for watching. Hit like, hit subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, see you on Saturday. Peace.